Good morning and welcome to Tea Leaves Programming. And today we're going to have another session of Gaming Like It's 1979. We're not actually Gaming Like It's 1979 though. We're going to Game Like It's 1987. Um, a few days ago, last week, um, I got some nostalgia to play Cliff Johnson's game from the uh, 2012 ish era called The Fool and His Money, which was itself a sequel to the 1987 game, The Fool's Errand. I, I still do want to show off The Fool and His Money, even though it's almost, I don't want to say it's impossible to play. It's harder to play it now because of technology changes. Uh, but I figured before I do that, I'd show off The Fool's Errand, the, the OG game that many of us remember from back in the day. So uh, I am uh, going to be streaming with uh, an emulator here. This is not a physical Mac. It's running Basilisk 2. And uh, we've got some games here. Many of them you may remember. Uh, many of them, if you're younger than uh, as extremely ancient I am, uh, you don't. And the Fool's Errand is one of them. So. The game comes with, I think, two apps. One of them is the prologue. Um, I hope I haven't finished the game on this emulator because I don't want to show you the finale. Let's see what happens if I run it. In vivid black and white. I don't remember if this had sound at all. I don't think it did. So something that is really weird about nostalgia gaming if you had a Mac is the Mac was a huge step forward and also a huge step backwards. Um, it was only black and white. There had been color computers for at least a decade when the Mac first came out. And you had this computer that was only black and white. We're actually emulating a later Mac that does have color, but but most of the Macs people had in 1987, most people could, probably couldn't afford a color Mac. They were that expensive. Um, but despite not having color, they had a much uh, finer resolution and fine detail than uh, kind of the PC level uh, computers you could use then. So we have, uh, this is a game that uses the tarot deck as a um, framing device. So we're going to start the game here. And uh, I, I would love it if someone would tell me, um, did this game originally have sound? I, I think it did. And I'm pretty sure I have sound configured on here. Let's make sure. Yeah, we got sound. Um, so I'm just going to assume it doesn't. Uh, all right. Fool and his money. Part of why this question is on my mind is that the fool and his money uh, makes very heavy use of these kind of, um, uh, I don't know if they're public domain, but stock footage sounds all over the place, every click. And so I've been playing that. And so it's, it's uncanny to me to not have sounds here. So this is the game. And I am going to save, I'm going to start immediately and save a new file just so I have, so I can keep the progress separate. Um, the game, as I said, is structured around the tarot deck. So you could see here we're using standard Mac interface, also something that happened a lot on the Mac side. Uh, all of these are puzzles, and most of them at this point are not selectable. As you finish some of the games, some of the puzzles, new ones will unlock. And there is a lot of uh, text in this game. The, you, the game tells a story as it goes along. Is it the greatest story in the world? Well, probably not. But the story itself contains puzzles. As you, the, the basic uh, premise here is the fool is walking along, about to walk off a cliff. I'm not gonna read the literal text. And the sun stops him and gives him a map to uh, the 14 treasures of the world. And so you can see here we have this little question mark that is actually a button. If we click the button, we get the sun's map. 
not a very useful map, but if we click on one of these uh, diamonds here, you can see it's a little picture. And if you click on all the diamonds, those are all the parts of the map, but you could also see there are plenty of blank spaces. And maybe you've already figured this out. Um, as you solve puzzles, new pieces will appear on the map. So um, I am going to be keeping at least one eye on the chat. Um, I can't promise that I'm going to pay immediate attention, especially if I'm solving a puzzle. I'm not uh, paying too close attention to it. All right, so our first puzzle here looks like is the Wheel of Fortune. Um, the text generally isn't that much help for the puzzle you're doing now. It will become more important when you try to solve the, the Sun's Map puzzle later in the game. All right, so they throw you right into this tarot card card game, which if my memory is it was one of, both one of the best and the worst games, uh, puzzles in the game, because it's a card game and you don't know the rules. Um, for all of the puzzles, you can go up to this uh, menu bar and it will tell you a little bit about the puzzle. Um, they're just saying score high, but they don't tell you really what things score. So you need to put together um, sets of cards here. So let's, there we go. That is finally a pair. So Hanged Man and Chariot, we now know are together. Uh, if you're playing this real time, you know, or not real time, if you're playing this in anger, you would probably have a notepad and be writing down what, uh, what makes a pair. So at this point, in order to win this game, you have to get to 666 points. And that doesn't strike me as fascinating streaming. So I'm gonna go on and do a different puzzle instead. Let's go to the world. And you can see here, there's like this highlighted uh, phrase in the um, uh, in the text that you could imagine that might be part of a puzzle, a different puzzle later. Um, also, I should say, there's going to be spoilers. You clicked on this video, you you should know what I'm doing. Uh, there will be spoilers for Fool's Errand in this playthrough. And I'm not going to, by the way, this I'm not going to be playing the whole game, as is my want. I'm going to play it for about. 15 minutes, half an hour, and then say, yay, I've shown you fool's errand. All right, so this looks like a word find. And there's a hint down here. My, there are so many countries. And immediately we see some countries, tells you how many are left. I think I can probably knock this out quickly without it getting too boring. Watching someone else do a word find uh, is always a very frustrating experience because I find that, you know, you'll see things that I'm not seeing and you'll be jumping up and down your seat. Hey, why don't you click on the obvious? You see France is right there. Good one there. Country that no longer exists, Czechoslovakia. Oh, right there, Austria. It was, I did see it earlier and then lost it. Okay, we've solved a word find and now it's not totally clear, but this actually unlocks a new puzzle and in fact, I think we were on the world, and you'll note that it took us somewhere else. It didn't go on to strength. It opened up a new puzzle, the maze of hedges. And I had forgotten this. The Fool's Errand opens with the vast majority of the game are certain types of puzzles, and then a minority of the puzzles, maybe a plurality, are really kind of unique. And the game really opens with its more unique puzzles first. The word find is kind of an exception here. Oh, this one is super frustrating. This might be awful. See, this is one where I remember there being sound. So you try and wander through this maze. And when you step on the wrong, so as you hit a wall, it will fill in, which is nice. But when you step on certain squares, that happens. Super annoying. And my recollection is, this is not random, every wind will, oh, here, I'll do it again. Oh, I thought every wind always took you to the same place, but I guess not. Uh, 
you can see we're getting little W's showing us where the winds are, which is helpful. So they act essentially like walls. And my recollection of this is that you have to go backwards to go forwards. It's kind of the, the nature of this maze. And so you can, and in fact I will, uh, brute force it a bit. What I'm learning is uh, this game hasn't aged well for me. And that's okay. You know, at the time, um, I certainly spent hours and hours playing this game. All right. And that brings us over here. A lot of very careful mouse skills in this game. And in fact, there are puzzles later in the game that I think will simply be intolerable on a modern system. Um, 1987, people hadn't quite decided what does user interaction look like, right? Um, what kinds of things is it reasonable to ask a user to do with a mouse? And uh, as a consequence, you, you have some patterns in this game that, that are just frustrating as heck um, and not in a good puzzly way, more like in a um, dexterity, humans with their monkey hands should not be asked to move a mouse in this particular way, type way. Oh my God. Okay, now here is an interesting one. This one did not kick us to a new puzzle. It just gives us a little more text and then we get to pick a new place. And so, did it actually, no, the little diamond I think means there's an uncompleted puzzle there. Let's take a look. Strength. Oh, and this is uh, this is just a puzzle. There's nothing uh, terribly uh, innovative about this, but it's a nice little jigsaw puzzle, so we can do this. Uh, and again, you know, 1987, this was cooler than it seems, uh, is what I would say. Uh, it's not that jigsaw puzzle games didn't exist back then, but uh, there were fewer games, is I guess how I would say it. Fewer games overall. Games just generally thin on the ground. Um, there's a similar puzzle in The Fool and His Money, which you will see if and when I do that game, where he tried to mix it up by making it so that when you're three quarters done with the puzzle, um, it shuffles it. <laughs> Uh, I don't really have the words for how frustrating and not a lot of fun I found that. Because it's the sort of thing like it's a one-time puzzle, essentially. Like once you know, oh, they're going to shuffle the puzzle when it's three quarters done, you know, it, it it's simply annoying. It's not actually, to me, entertaining. Other people may disagree. Um, one thing I've learned is that everyone, particularly with puzzle games, everyone has a very different tolerance or, you know, they want different things. Oh, I just, no, that looks wrong. There we go. And we've solved a puzzle and we get a little more of the tarot story. And we'll just click on this and see what it is. Oh, um, yeah. I, I feel like this might be a theme and <laughs> uh, that I'll tell you, oh, I love Fool's Errand. I love it so much. It's such a great game. And then like, as I get to the puzzles, um, you'll catch me saying this one, I hate this puzzle. This is my least favorite puzzle. Uh, so let's, you know, it's some sort of word scramble. How would you solve it? Return to the scroll. Find the hidden letters below and enter them into the blank boxes. All right, so spoilers here. If you want to play this yourself, you know, go forward by five minutes or... Uh, so what you do, if I recall correctly, let's see, is you move the mouse around the screen, and then if you get very lucky, uh, the cursor will change. That's what I recall. 
but I don't see. I actually remember. I, I just remember the key phrase here. So I, worst case, I will just type it in, uh, spoiling the game for you. I, I, but it's, again, this is one where, to me, is not at all clear um, how one is supposed to solve this. Oh, there we go. All right. So let's find that again. T-O-T-H-E-E. A S T. So is that a good puzzle? Is that interesting? Is that fun? I don't know. I don't know. To me, that is like so oblique. Um, to be polite to it or to be generous, part of what Fool's Aaron does, that's why we remember it is that it breaks the rules of how Mac apps at the time worked. Um, in retrospect, it, it does feel kind of unfair, and I'll tell you why. You, you, there were games on the Mac that did not use the Mac UI, right? That took over the full screen like most games. And by kind of using the menus, I feel like that's a very straightforward signal to the user that you're going to the, that the application the game is going to follow the rules of the ui and what cliff johnson does time and again in fool's era time and again he breaks the rules of the ui he changes what the mouse does changes how the mouse cursor works maybe you're gonna i don't remember if this is actually a puzzle but maybe you're gonna move the mouse to the right and the cursor is gonna move to the left and so I'm conflicted about that because on the one hand, I find that super frustrating. I also find it, I can easily imagine people who spend a lot of time flailing because they don't see that they're not even, it's not even entering their consciousness that that's what's happening. It just feels like a bug. But on the other hand, as I said, this is part of why we remember the game. Uh, so maybe the question kind of answers itself. Whether I like it or not is kind of beside the point. All right, let's this puzzle. Ooh, these are my favorite puzzles. So for a while, um, there, I get, to, I get to say I love this puzzle. For a while, Cliff Johnson had a website. It seems to be down now, which is part of what inspired me to talk about The Fool and His Money. You, it's very hard to get because his website has gone down. Um, but for a while, he had this type of puzzle, a cryptogram, on his website one every, I think it was one every day. And I just loved it. I was like a regular visit for me on the internet was making sure I went and solved the, the cryptogram. Okay, so you could see here, we have something here, zoom equals sadness. So that is pretty clearly a key. So I'm going to type this in. X is D, C is N. M is E. Oh, did I uh, mistype? I totally did. There we go. Okay. Well, the message is as clear as day. B U C Leman U E X A Zame Un If Ectatios and Sebasiquinum Ixis Dictaudes. As I'm sure you are all familiar with ancient Syrian, this is a. Okay, yeah, I'm just kidding. Uh, the rest of this, now that the key is filled in, is up to us. So this could be A or I, but if is a word. So that seems like might have lucked into that. And a three letter word ending in E, I'm going to make the, I'm going to postulate that that is the two letter word ending in E, I'm going to postulate that that is B, could be he. He is a word, uh, but we also have two one letter words. One of them is already A, so this is either I something A or A something I. I'm gonna go I something A. And in, well, it could be on as well. And he, say was, Four-letter word with two letters the same. If 
W and E are correct. That's probably well. Well, he's something. I blah, blah. I N. This looks like seeking. Egan. Well, he began. I met a sage. How about I met a sage in my travels? And he was seeking the Zeromeds. The Zeromeds, they're very famous, almost as famous as the pyramids. Oh, and sage is not right, it's page. Well, he began, I met a page in my travels and he was seeking the pyramids. That looks correct to me, but clearly I've got something wrong. Oh no, it was right, I think. Okay, well, we've got a new puzzle here. This is a magic square. I don't believe it needs to be um, read backwards. To solve this puzzle, rearrange letters to create three words that read horizontally and three words that read vertically. Read, not read. The center letter is already collect. Okay, so what words have, what three letter words have a C? Well, there's ace, there's ice. How about new and so? It gives us daz and din. Daz is not a word. I feel like that has to be there. Sad, sin, new, do, ace, ice. All right, we got it. That was harder than I, harder than I remembered it being. Okay, we have a little bit of plot here. And uh, I've been choosing things in the menu, you can also scroll back. So there's the puzzle we just did. If you click on the one with the star, I believe it just shows you the state of the puzzle. And I think this flashing S has to do with the metagame at the end. Temperance. Fifth anniversary. I think that's wood. Eighth anniversary. Uh, I'm going to power through these. This is one, and this is a problem we're going to have, is that if you remember the answers, you remember the answers. And I kind of do, mostly, for this. So You do get to learn what many of these anniversaries are. I did, had not known any of them, really, other than maybe gold. Uh, one thing about the fool and his money, which is probably good or bad, depending on who you are, is that the word puzzles in that game, um, he really cranked up the difficulty. Fool and his money is probably 10 times as hard as this game, I would say. Even the word puzzles, which one would not think, uh, how hard can they be? Turns out they can be pretty hard. Uh, my friend uh, Zarf, who um, I had an interview with about his game Systems Twilight, which is similar in some ways to the Cliff Johnson games, uh, he had an opinion about specifically about The Fool and His Money, which was that, that um, writing a Python script to generate the answer for you is, 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 to solve the puzzle is solving the puzzle. And uh, I think that's a good, a good way to look at it. All right, so I'm going to skip. This is another word find. This time you're looking for vegetables. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and do the entire word find because I'd rather show you a different type of puzzle. Which one is this? The canopy. I do, however, want to know if I come back to that puzzle later. So I'm going to start this puzzle just to... Okay, we go to the canopy. Does it remember your state? Okay, it does. So, well, let's go to that hierophant. Well, let, let's look at some different ones. That's another word find. That's another word puzzle. I'll come back and do that one if uh, we don't find a better one. Okay, so this is a type of puzzle we haven't done yet. 
in this game. Uh, this is Tetrominoes. Well, they're not really Tetrominoes, but you know what I mean. Tetris-ish pieces combined with some words. So, what are these words? And that one looks like it's given. And was there one in the middle here? No, it's just that first one. My. Oh, sorry, I just remembered this one. Yeah, the replayability of these, it's surprisingly high, but in parts, you know, when you remember the answer, it's probably less fun. But that's a cool type of puzzle, I think. I like that it's combining these two hints. I mean, you could think of it as just a jigsaw puzzle, right? Only the, um, the, uh, the things you're matching are not a pattern, but a word. I kind of dig that. All right, let's go back here. Oh, so this one I'll show you. Um, we're not going to do this one. Uh, in fact, if I do a full playthrough of this game, I may just skip this one and do it offline. Epilepsy warning. If flashing lights are a problem for you, skip forward by a minute. Uh, this is one of those puzzles where he's playing with UI, and it's really unpleasant. Um, but to make up for being unpleasant, it's also hugely long. So we have these tiles coming through. Run for your life or press each button in descending order from 99 to 1. Well, I saw 99 there, so I'm going to click on it. And the instant you click, as you hold down the button, I'm going to hold down the button for a count of three here. One, two, three. You get this flashy interference pattern. Now, oddly, the interference pattern actually helps you find, I just disappeared, the next one. And so I just, I think, just rolling the mouse over actually clicked it. And so you can kind of cheat the game a little bit of a year by rolling your mouse around and hoping you hit the right one. Um, there's 94, 93. Boy, if you are obsessive compulsive, this, this game will do it for you. But I find this deeply, deeply unpleasant to look at, so we're going to skip it. Uh, what haven't we done here? I don't think we've done justice. Oh, so this one, this is a different type of game as well. The secret hides here if 25 appear. Uh, so each button you click, I think, will side effect the cell next to it. Right. And I think you want 25 eyes. Um, and I want to say that there's some level of pattern matching going on here. But I don't remember exactly what it was. One, two, three, four, five. No, I just reset it. Okay. Uh, this one will take I think like if you don't know the answer and I don't, it will take a lot of trial and error. But it's a it's a nifty type of puzzle and trying to to figure out how it works. I recall liking this one. So it's a good example of a, a fun little puzzle. Let's do the cherry. And have I done that one yet? This is another one of these jigsaw puzzles. We're coming up on 50 minutes. So I'm gonna we'll do that one in another playthrough if we keep playing. Oh, okay, so here's another one that um, hasn't aged well. Uh, and this one I will do the beginning of it, and then I'm going to not finish it on the stream uh, because it's painful to watch. So what is what do you do here? Well, to find a hidden secret, you follow each line correct and true. Okay, well, let's start there. And 
that seems pretty easy to remember. How hard can that be? Great, get a little flash. And now it begins. And so this pattern is going to get more and more complicated. Ah, I made a mistake there. I think it's down one here and down two on the next one. No, it looks like down three. Down one. One, two, three. Oh, I messed up. Three, three. Okay. I'm going to do this one and then I'm going to stop because as you might imagine, uh, when you get to the end of this, you have to draw the entire thing from memory. It's super annoying and I don't feel like doing it, so I'm not going to. Uh, I do appreciate that he gave this ability to context switch between puzzles left and right or, you know, on and off, go and, and start them and stop them at will. That's uh, a bit of UI that I do appreciate that more games should allow. Oh, I'm terrible at this, these type of puzzles. So this is essentially some sort of interference puzzle. So you click on these things and each one of these does some sort of shape and the shapes interfere with each other. And if you click around enough, you start to see patterns and you might get the sense that what you're trying to do is make some letters appear. And in fact, that is exactly what you're trying to do. In fact, did he tell you there? Yeah, three secret letters. Okay, so I didn't actually spoil that. Uh, I don't know how much effort I want to put into this. These can be... Uh, I'm sure there is a, a um, Fool and His Money is full of these type of puzzles. I'm sure there is a correct way to do them, to systematically figure out uh, what is getting you closer versus getting you further away. And I don't think I've ever figured out what that is. I, I click my way to, you know, it looks better or worse. I'm basically playing eye doctor, better or worse, better or worse. Um, and I don't know. I, I don't find that amazingly satisfying. So it looks like I'm looking for something here on the, the bottom to finish that middle letter. So I'm going to, that N might be relevant. That H might be relevant. We're getting close here. But anyway, I, I would love to know if you have done the, this type of puzzle and you have a technique. Yeah, that is definitely related. I would love to know what is your technique? What is your system for doing these? So right now I feel like I've got the, the first two thirds of this correct. So maybe I only care about buttons that affect only the right. Sadly, most of these. Oh, All right, we did it. Oh, we've got another. So what's one? The chant? I'm going to come back to that one because I like these, but I want to see if I can find you some other. Okay, we've got another jigsaw puzzle there. Another um, cryptogram. Another jigsaw, just to give you an idea of kind of the frequency. Another word search. So there's a lot of word searches, cryptograms. Have I done the hangman? That's another jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, so that's that's where we are. You know what? Let's do, let's go out on a high note. Let's do one more cryptogram because I like it. And then I will call this stream done. Hi, Greg. Yes, it is dastardly, uh, Greg in the stream. Uh, the puzzles range from, okay, actually, uh, they range from trivial to 
painful. I'm going to do this jigsaw puzzle. I'm going to do it for a very specific reason. You might have remembered me mentioning a fish. And I think because I see the fish in this jigsaw puzzle, I believe that if and when I finish this one, um, this will lead us to the story with the fish I was talking about. Showing these games off to me is more interesting than solving them to 100%. I don't know who wants to watch someone solve a game 100% unless they're looking for a walkthrough. Um, you know, no, no offense to people who, who do want that. Um, I, I very much, but I feel like seeing what they're about, that to me is kind of more useful. Uh, Greg in the chat says, the puzzle game I remember from Atari 800 was Puzzle Panic, which was cognitively way easier than this, but was real time and frustrating. I never played Puzzle Panic. Um, I could install an Atari 800 emulator and try it out. Uh, or Greg, if you wanted to guest host the show and take us through Puzzle Panic, I would love to learn about it. Prepare yourself mentally and physically for this puzzle. We are going to try and uh, start the puzzle. Well, there's a, a, um, a button there with a question mark on it. Let me click on it. Oh, I thought I was sure that this was going to unlock that puzzle. I'll just tell you about it. And then if I unlock this in a future playthrough, uh, I'll get to it. What, what the puzzle ends up being is that the button moves away from your mouse cursor. You try and click on the button and it just floats away. Um, and, and this is mind blowing in 1987. Like there are rules for how your mouse cursor is supposed to work. And the game violated those rules. And it was very clever and very memorable. It's probably one of the puzzles from the Fool's Errand that I remember the most. All right, so I said we were gonna go out on a high note, which we will. We're gonna go out on Yes, I, you would smash your Mac keyboard. We're going to no, not canopy. I said we were going to go out on a, um, on a uh, cryptogram. Now I've lost the cryptogram. Ooh, okay, that's a different one. So here, let's, uh, let's try it. We're going to click on death. Very appropriate. You can see that thing is coming for us. And if you let it touch you, you die. You're back, you have not solved the puzzle. So what do you have to do here? Well, try to press the white button without being hit by the black button. And so by, by pulling down the menu bar, we've now paused everything. And that should let us hit the white button. And I think that means we solved that level. We did, although it will let us do it again. Uh, it does seem unfair that the white button is not even visible. Oh wait, okay, that's cute. So the white button appears when the cursor is up here, but then disappears when you're down. So this is close enough to my fish example that uh, it's okay. That's a, a good example of, of what I was talking about. Uh, I need to find, it was the chant I think was, the, there we go. Okay, this will be our last puzzle for the day and then I'm gonna call it. Uh, well, we've got two one-letter words. Those have to be either A or I. I'm going to say, assume that the first word is I. Although, three-letter word beginning with I, maybe not. Let's make that an A and then assume that our three letter word is and I something. Okay, this YQS, YQS, that three letter word appears twice. So I'm going to assume that it's V. Uh, and already we've got, if we assume that these are correct, I, A, N, and T, this word has to be giant. These letters were all correct. So near, giant wheel, something, and I saw, and I saw, three something words. 
one atop of the other. This word must be pyramids. Mystical. A giant wheel stood near the pyramids. I saw three mystical words, one atop the other. The last thing I will do is I will go back to the first puzzle in the game, which is the sun. And we'll look at the sun's map, and you can kind of tell here that there are more of these diamonds filling in. And the final puzzle of the game is to figure out the order to unscramble the sun's map. And that's not a spoiler because they tell you at the very beginning of the game that that is the goal of the game. Well, so this is Fool's Errand. Um, I don't know if there's appetite for people to watch me play all of it. As I said, I'm kind of skeptical about that. Um, Cliff Johnson made some other games. I've mentioned The Fool and His Money, which there's a lot of story about that game. Um, if you go to my now mostly defunct blog, you'll see that I mention The Fool and His Money. Uh, when was it? It was like 2004, 2005. Uh, it can't have been that early. Uh, yeah, 2004. I mentioned that game. The sequel to The Fool's Errand is going to come out in 2004. And the game did not eventually release. It was almost 10 years later that uh, the game came out. And I'll talk more about that in my episode on The Fool and His Money. But he also, let me save the game. He also did some other games that were similar to The Fool's Errand, uh, but also different. Uh, do I have some of them here? I believe I do. I have at least two of them here. Uh, there's At the Carnival, also called Puzzle Gallery, which felt like this was meant to be um, this was meant to be a um, like a series. Ooh, it's in color, so you could see his technology has moved on a bit. Um, and Puzzle Gallery is kind of the easier types of games from Fool's Errand. And so Puzzle Gallery, I think, is a better introduction for if you have a younger person who wants to play. Puzzle Gallery might be the perfect level of difficulty. If you're looking for kind of the more oblique, uh, challenging stuff, um, it might not be your, uh, your cup of tea. And you could see here also, we just started a new game of this, and all of all of the puzzles, basically, except if there's a meta puzzle, uh, I don't remember. All the puzzles are unlocked, so it's really a very friendly game. Uh, the other one he did that is very, uh, is frankly, my favorite of everything he ever did is this game 3 and 3. 3 and 3, for my money and my time, more importantly, is, I think, the most balanced of his games. Fool's Aaron has some little weird UI stuff that hasn't aged well. Puzzle Gallery, a little too easy. Fool and His Money, you know, it's too hard for me. The game is just too hard for me. Three and Three has some brain burners, but I never feel like everything in it is completely out of reach. That I, I, I do feel that way in The Fool and His Money sometimes. So there you go. Thank you for joining me on this um, this uh, 1980s Mac era journey. Uh, this has been Gaming Like It's 1979. Thanks for watching. <laughs>